Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Emma and this channel is all about sewing, mainly hand sewing. But today's video is a bit different to my usual ones because today's video is a Q&A video, something that I've never done before. But we're going to cover a whole range of topics. I asked here on YouTube, I asked on Patreon, I asked my newsletter subscribers and I asked on Instagram for questions to answer for this video and I received so many really interesting questions so thank you so much if you sent me a question. So as we have so many I'm just going to get straight into it. I've tried to group them by topic so we have personal questions which are about me and my family and my life. Then we'll move on to the design and inspiration type questions. Then I have some general questions about sewing in general and things like that. And then there are more specific questions about English paper piecing and hexiform, so we'll finish up with those. So I've really tried hard to look through all of the questions. There were some repeating questions, lots of people asking the same things. So I just sort of grouped all of those together. Um, if I miss your question out or if I miss saying your name or something like that, then I'm really, really sorry. I really tried my best to, to get everything in there, but I did receive a lot of questions, which I'm really thankful for. So if I do miss yours, I'm really sorry. Let's get started. Let's get started with the general questions. So Jojo over on Patreon asked me, who taught you to sew? And who taught you English paper piecing and how did you get into doing it on YouTube? That's a really great question, Jojo, thank you. So I learned to sew when I was about five years old, I think five to six years old. And it was my mum who taught me and I remember her teaching me embroidery. My mum is a knitter and she learnt to knit when she was about five years old. And so she must have thought that it was a good time for me to learn to do some stitching. And she gave me her little embroidery kits that she had when she was little that she hadn't finished. And they were like little table mats with designs printed on them, floral designs, and I remember a tiny little embroidery hoop about this big, a red one, and I remember her teaching me the embroidery stitches, Lazy Daisy Stitch, Stem Stitch, I remember learning those from her with the lovely different colours of embroidery threads, and I actually remember taking those kits out with me when I went to my drama group at the weekend on Sunday afternoons, and even though I was so little, I remember taking it with me and doing it when I was sat at the side when I wasn't needed for the rehearsal. So, yeah, it's been something that I've been doing my whole life, really. Um, I also remember getting kits for my birthday when I was about that age, five, six, seven. And I remember getting a sewing kit where you could make a little purse, a little case for your scissors. I think there was some a key ring or something like that and it there were pieces of plastic with holes point, punched in them around the edge and you had raffia and a big needle and you could put them together and stitch them up and then you had the completed items and I remember doing those and really really enjoying it so they were my first projects really and that's how I learned to sew so she asked about English paper piecing. Well, that wasn't something that was ever done in my family. So my gran, my mum, they are really knitters predominantly. My my gran was really good at crochet and an incredible at hand sewing. And she had a job in a dress shop, in a, in a gown shop, she called it, when she was about 14. And when they were doing hems, on the dresses they used to make my grand <laughs> stitch the hems because she was just so neat um, so they they weren't quilters though they they never did any quilting so I remember when I was about 23 24 picking up a dress pattern for the first time and my mum showing me how to how you follow a dress pattern and how to make a dress and I made a few dresses and things like that but I remember really struggling with fit trying to get garments to fit and I remember this the 3D nature of dressmaking just 
just finding it a challenge and I must have seen a quilt or something somewhere and thinking to myself maybe that's easier because it's flat <laughs> well <laughs> that's how I started with getting interested in quilting and then I ended up going to the festival the festival of quilts it must have been 2015 2016 that time and learning about English paper piecing there and then going home and doing some research online and I remember thinking it's not for me it's too time consuming it involves cutting out paper shapes and tacking them tacking the fabric round it by hand before you even sew them together and I really love embroidery and I'll never have time to do that if I'm always doing this and I just thought I don't have time for English paper piecing in my life but it kept cropping up I kept seeing it online and I kept being really interested in it and also I'd followed Florence Knapp online for many years and I'd been following blogs um, quilting blogs dressmaking blogs I, I was an avid blog reader so I think that's probably where I first saw quilts and things because they are so popular in America and yeah it probably come from blogs and I remember Florence making a quilt she'd done dressmaking but she was making a quilt and English paper piecing and things like that and then I'd gone back to the festival of quilts and discovered hexiform already pre-cut into shapes that you don't need to remove so I thought okay that could be doable for me and because they are a fabric and you could stitch into them I remember thinking well I can do my embroidery as well I can embellish it with embroidery perhaps and I also discovered the shop Sew and Quilt and the lovely lady Jessie who runs that shop she had some great blog posts with tutorials for English paper piecing so that's where I learned the techniques really was from her and I bought papers pre-cut papers and glue pens from her and that's how I discovered the glue pen so it was a combination of discovering the glue pen and the pre-cut papers and the hexiform pre-cut once I discovered all of that and I learned the techniques I realized yes this is something that I can do I can probably fit this into my life and that's how I started really so fast forward a few years by about 2019 at that point I was a stay-at-home mom and I was spending my son's nap times crafting making things because I decided that was the time that I was going to dedicate to my hobbies I'd never had much time for hobbies before that because of working and things so that's what I was doing and I decided to start sharing it on Instagram because I'd been following other people on Instagram mainly knitters actually for many years and really enjoyed it and wanted to be part of the community I was really looking for a connection with people at that time because I'd been at home on my own with my son for a long time and I just needed that connection that's something different in my life and so I joined in with the community and started sharing there and my account really grew quite quickly throughout 2019 which was a complete surprise to me and it gave me some confidence and I ended up sharing my hexagon sewing case and people were asking me for a pattern for it so that's how I ended up selling patterns but all the way throughout that time people were asking me do you have a YouTube channel because I've been sharing little tips and tutorials and things on my Instagram account through video which actually wasn't something that was as common as it is now back then people weren't really showing videos very much but as a teacher it just sort of came natural to me and I'll talk a bit about my job when we come on to the next question but I'd actually done some filming of my sewing to teach the children how to do cross stitch in school so it was just natural to me to film myself so I was sharing those short videos on Instagram and people were asking me all the time you should have you got a YouTube channel? You should start a YouTube channel. So I thought to myself, I'm not really cut out for YouTube. I can't sit and face a camera. I'm too shy. I'm too introverted. I, I don't think I can do that. But then I started watching YouTube videos and seeing people were sharing their techniques 
really in a similar way to how I was on Instagram, just my hands, but in a, in a longer form, long form video on YouTube. So I started to consider it. And when the pandemic hit, my husband was furloughed and he was actually really pleased about that because although we were really worried about what it would mean and all the uncertainty that comes with that, it allowed him to spend time with our son that he hadn't had before because he'd been going to work every day. So, so, so we were all at home so I thought, well, I may as well give YouTube a try then since people are asking me about it a lot and now we have more time on our hands and we're all at home. So April 2020, I started the YouTube channel and as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> Here, here's where we are now. So it wasn't intentional really. It just sort of came about. I gave it a go. I decided to myself that year that I was going to push myself a bit out of my comfort zone and take some risks and it, it, it paid off because I think YouTube is the best thing that I've I've done really I'm so grateful for it because it it really is I just love this connection with you guys so anyway <laughs> so thank you for that question Jojo um, and also also on patreon Leslie asked me have I ever worked and if so in what field and what does my husband do for a living so I guess that fi fits in with what I was just talking about that yes I actually have always worked in some way or other. I got my first job when I was 14 in a cafe in a garden centre and I really loved doing that. And so throughout those teenage years and while I was studying at college and university, I've always had part-time jobs. And I studied languages. I have a degree in Spanish and Italian and I have a master's degree in translation. So by the time I'd done all of that, I was trying to decide which career path to take and trying to find my feet with that. And around that time, they introduced languages into primary schools. And there were three local primary schools that had teamed up together and they were advertising a job for a Spanish teacher. And you didn't have to be a qualified teacher to do it. So you were paid as an unqualified teacher. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll give that a go. I went for the job and I got it and absolutely fell in love with teaching, fell in love with primary school teaching. So that's age, from ages five to 11. So I was teaching the whole age range across three schools and I was teaching them Spanish. And I did that job for three years and it absolutely convinced me that teaching was for me. So I then was accepted into a programme for training on the job to become a fully fledged, fully qualified primary school teacher. I did that right up to when our son came along and at that point in my life, I, we made the decision as a family for me to stay at home and be a stay at home mum. The idea was that I was going to go back into teaching when he starts school and he's been at school for quite a while now but because I developed this small business online we decided that we'd give it a go for a few years to see if I could make that work so that's where I'm at at the moment I have gone back to teaching and done some supply teaching but then left that and carried on with my business in in these last few years so I've done a bit of both to make things work so I'm still working on my business, growing that and to see if that's something I'm going to continue with or if eventually I will need to go back into teaching full time. So if, you're, if you've supported me here on YouTube, through my shop or on Patreon, then a huge thank you to you because you've helped me to continue this um, because I wouldn't be able to do both at once. That just would be wouldn't be possible for me so it really does mean a lot to our family so I hope that answered your question Leslie um oh yes you asked about my husband well he works in the horse racing industry and he works on race courses up and down the country so he travels a bit for that it's to do with betting and I don't really know what else he does <laughs> so 
Yep. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> and thank you for that. So still in the sort of personal section, <laughs> Yvette on YouTube asked me, would I consider doing a video about how I started my son off with sewing? And she has three-year-old twins, so she's thinking about getting them into sewing. So I haven't thought about doing a video on that really, but I can definitely point you in the direction of some really good resources. So when my son was about two, I got him a set of... Um, it, it, I got him a set of, they're like wooden animals with holes all around the edges and you get some laces, like shoelaces. So they've got those the hard end to them so you can poke it really easily through the holes. And I started him off with those and he, just threading really. And you can also get a set of wooden beads that you can thread onto laces. So that's a really great way to start your children off with sewing and a three-year-olds could definitely have a go at that great for dexterity and great for fine motor skills so doing activities like that will be really beneficial to them when later on they come to picking up a pen and writing it's really great for that as well as obviously learning the sewing skills so I'll leave a link in the description box to those activities that you can buy um, I think you can find them on Amazon so I'll find those and I'll link them down below and then once he'd mastered that. I then bought him uh, a set of hand puppets so they're felt and they have the holes already punched in them all the way around and you get things to stick on them to make the face and then you get some wool and a plastic needle and you can show your children how to sew them together and that's a really nice simple way of teaching them to sew and then they've got a hand puppet at the end of it so I did th those with my son and once we'd done a couple he could do them by himself and then the most recent thing that we did which I'm not sure if I will be able to link this one but we made teddy bears and it was a box with three different size bears in for the three the three bears from Goldilocks and the three bears and you had it all ready and you just had to stuff the bears and then sew them up a bit like a builder bear so I'll look for that I'm not sure if I'll be able to find that one though but look out for little activities like that that's a great way to get children started and then they've got something that they've made afterwards so they get that sense of achievement so thank you for your question Yvette and Lee over on Instagram asked me can you sew with family around or is it best on your own well Personally, I actually don't really sew when family is around. I think it's probably because when my son was little, I never used to sew around him at all because I was terrified of sharp needles and scissors and things going near him. And I only ever did it when he was asleep, in his nap times or at night. But um, if he's watching TV, now he's much older, sometimes I do pick up a project crochet or something like that and um, if we go to family's houses for, for a visit to stay I usually do take a project with me but if we're all talking and chatting and stuff like that catching up then I don't tend to get my projects out very much actually it for me it tends to be something that I do quite solitary on my own um, but from time to time I will bring a project out if everybody's watching tv or something like that so thank you for that question, Lee. So Jenny on YouTube asked me, are you very strict with yourself when it comes to buying fabric and supplies? It can be very easy to buy lovely fabric without having a clear idea of what you're going to do with it. Does this happen to you? Yes, <laughs> it definitely does. I'm pretty sure everybody watching this would be able to relate to seeing the lovely fabric and being tempted and buying it even though we don't have a plan for it because we just can't resist it so yes that definitely happens you're you're not alone with that Jenny nowadays I absolutely have to be strict with myself and I actually don't look for new things to buy very much at all anymore I tend to just buy for a project so for example the quilt as you go quilt I have been buying some fabric specifically for that and um, 
when I feel like my supply has run out I'll buy some more just for that but I don't buy it all in one go because that is a kind of scrappy nature type quilt isn't it so I don't buy it all at once I do just try to be careful and very much buy exactly what I need now as I go along I don't I really try hard not to see the lovely fabric and just buy it and think oh one day I'll use it but I will I would definitely say that I'm sure that will happen to me again because it can be difficult to re resist oh just a fat quarter <laughs> it's only it's only small I hope that answers your question Jenny thank you so much for that so moving into the more general questions now Shelley on YouTube asked would you consider a live zoom monthly stitching bee and she talks about how nice it would be for us to get together and everybody work on their own projects and do that together and I think I've had had another question about doing live zoom stitching and things like that and I have thought about that actually because I do think that would be a really nice community thing to do together um, but I just wasn't sure that it was something that I could commit to. I do have quite a full week with my commitment to YouTube, my commitment to Patreon and then taking care of my son when he's not in school and there are school holidays and things like that so I just wasn't sure that it was something that I would really be able to commit to and I, I'm quite a quiet person and I'm just not sure I'd be the best host. I do think it's a really really lovely idea and I would definitely never say never but thank you so much for asking that. Um, then I had a few questions about sewing machines, vintage sewing machines. So Sewy Thingy said, do you ever sew on vintage machines? Suzanne asked me, can I show a treadle machine? And someone else asked me about what needle do I use in my Juki? So I just, in terms of the Juki, I, my modern sewing machine, I just use the needle that came with it. I haven't actually bought any new needles or different types of needles for that because I'm, I just piece cotton fabric on it so I don't need particularly special needles or anything like that so I've just been using the ones that c come with it. Um, do I ever sew on my vintage machine? No, I have one vintage sewing machine, it is a hand crank, it's not a treadle so I'm really sorry Suzanne I can't show you how to use a treadle machine because I don't have one. I would love one, I think they look beautiful but I don't have one at the moment so I can't show you that and no I don't sew on my hand crank I actually do have more than that vintage sewing machine. I have some children's um, vintage sewing machines as well, but they're all hand crank machines. And I've often thought about getting them out and using them. And maybe it's something for a video one day because I am really interested in using them. I do really like sewing machines, even though most of what I do, and most of what you see from me is hand sewing. I do really enjoy sewing machines so maybe one day I'll get the chance to really explore that topic so thank you for that. So um, Craft Dipper asked me, this is about the Quilt As You Go project, how do Quilt As You Go quilts drape? Are they better for wall hangings or rather than snuggling on the sofa? And that's a really interesting question. And it's actually not something I can give you a proper answer to at the moment, I'm afraid, because I'm not far along enough with my quilt to really make a good judgment on that. I use quite thin batting. I use the Hobbs Heirloom batting and it does have some drape to it. And because I've used Liberty fabric to back it, it's quite thin. Nothing about it feels stiff. But I can't really gauge any more than that until I've made it much bigger. So in a few months time I will report back on that and hopefully be able to give you a better answer. However, if there's anybody watching this that has made their quilt to a significant size or has made a quilt as you go quilt in the past, please let us know in the comments what you think about whether it's more suitable for a wall hanging or something decorative or whether you can snuggle under it on the sofa. Because I'm putting a lot of applique and embroidery on mine, 
I am sort of thinking it's going to be more of a decorative piece rather than a quilt that's used every day. I can't see myself letting my son drag that around and make a den out of it. Um, I think that's it's a bit more of a delicate piece than that. But let me know what you think if you've made one. And thank you so much for that question, Craft Dipper. Right, just had to take a little break then for a drink. <laughs> I'm not used to talking so much. So back to the general, sort of the questions in the sort of general um, section. Linda on YouTube asked me, um, I wonder if you could talk about how you deal with all your scraps. Do you keep every, everything or scraps bigger than say an inch and a half? Do you neaten them or prepare them in any way for future projects? Well, actually, Linda, I keep pretty much everything unless it's really, really tiny, like a quarter of an inch, maybe half an inch square, that kind of size. If I can't get a quarter inch hexi out of it, then I'll throw it away or put it into a little basket and keep it for stuffing things like pin cushions. But I, I don't tend to throw very much away at all, really. Um, I don't have a huge amount of scraps like I know some quilters do. I know that if you're making quilts, you know, if you're a pro prolific quilter and you're making quilts, maybe 12 quilts a year or something like that, then you will have so many scraps. And I just don't have that kind of problem because I make one or two quilts a year and I, the rest of what I make is on a much smaller scale, usually out of scraps. I don't really have any fabric in my stash that is anything bigger than a fat quarter really. Yes, sorry, I had to change the camera battery then. So if things have moved a bit, that that's why. So as I was saying, I don't tend to make that many big quilts. All my projects are really small. So if I have a fat quarter, I usually have most of it left after I've used the little bit that I might need. So I don't have huge amounts of scraps. I've shown before, I think, I've definitely shown it on Instagram, how I have a trolley where I put my scraps in that and I have some boxes as well. And I tend to put the tiny pieces in the smaller box what I call medium sized pieces, which might be two and a half inches to about five inches in that kind of size. I put them in the medium sized box and then anything that's bigger than that, but smaller than a fat eighth, tends to be in the different tiers of my trolley. As you can probably tell from my answer, <laughs> there isn't a lot of rhyme and reason. I don't have a process. So I know how some quilters will get all their scraps, trim them all down to two and a half inch squares or something like that. I just don't have a process for that because I'm not using those sizes all the time like typical quilters are. I don't consider myself to be um, a typical quilter in that sense. I just work in a really sort of scrappy way. I don't have a process for that. I think I'd be better organised if I did, but I don't tend to really need lots of a particular size. I just, I'm just a bit ad hoc and a bit go of the flow. So yeah, so I just, I tend to store them by size and I don't really, I don't need to, I don't trim them at all because I'm always looking for where I can squeeze in a little hexagon here and then. I'm looking for the flowers for fussy cutting so I don't trim them. I just see what I'm making and what I can squeeze out of that piece. So I hope that makes sense. Thank you for your question. So next question in sort of the general category is from Lottie on YouTube and she says, um, did you feel daunted when you started a new craft? For example, crochet or embroidery? And she said, I know you said your grandmother taught you from a young age, but she's starting out later in life and feels a little nervous where to start. She tends to spend more time watching how to do it than actually doing it herself. And she wondered, is she the only one that feels the same way? Well, thank you for your question, Lottie. Um, I 
I think my probably my best example of this would be teaching myself to crochet. My mum is a knitter. My gran is a knitter and a crocheter as well. But she, at the point in my life when I was 18, that's the that was the time when I wanted to learn to crochet. And she, my gran, my mum didn't know how to do it and my gran didn't have the, wasn't able to teach me. She bought me a book though. So I borrowed a book from her and she bought me a book and I used those to teach myself. This was before the days of YouTube and anything like that. So I did feel a bit daunted because I really struggled. I found it hard. I found the way you're supposed to hold the hook difficult and how you're supposed to tension the yarn through your fingers and I ended up just finding my own way to do it and I persevered. I, I remember struggling and struggling and struggling and I didn't give up and in the end I could do it. So yes it was a bit daunting at first there were moments when I thought am I ever going to be able to do this but I think if you just keep trying and you try not to let anything put you off then you can definitely do it. Whatever craft is that you're thinking of, whether it's English paper piecing, embroidery, whatever it is, watching YouTube tutorials and things like that are a really great way to learn. Definitely have a look through books and things as well. Um, it's good to have different visuals, isn't it? So photographs are sometimes really helpful, but obviously video as well is really good. And just have a go just take the plunge and I know it can be difficult that jumping off point but do remind yourself that if it doesn't quite go right then at the, at the very worst you might need to unpick your stitches you may have wasted a bit of fabric and a bit of thread but it won't be very much so it, it's not it doesn't come at a great cost if it goes wrong it's not it's not a complete disaster, kind of easier said than done, but I know there'll be lots of people that have, that do feel like that. It can, it can feel daunting when you're watching other people who have mastered that skill and that's something that you really want to learn too, but do remember that you can do it, you absolutely can. It just, it's just going to take some practice and it takes everybody a different amount of time to learn something but don't be put off just have a go i hope that helps thank you for your question lottie so another question in, in this sort of general section is from ronelle on instagram and she says how do you find the time for everything that you do um that is a really good question i think pretty much everybody we would all say, wouldn't we, that we just don't have enough hours in the day to do everything that we'd like to do. Um, and I definitely feel that all the time. So at, currently at the moment, I do have more time to do sewing than I've ever had before, which is really lucky. I, I feel really grateful for that. A lot of the sewing that I'm doing is my work sewing, if you want to call it that. So things for YouTube and designs and patterns and workshops, but that is still really, really enjoyable to me. So it doesn't always feel like work. It, it sometimes does when it involves writing up a pattern and um, meeting a deadline and things like that and filming yourself. I, as much as I love making videos, the filming process isn't as relaxing as it is when you're just sitting on the couch and doing some sewing. Having a camera there and thinking about all of that. So in that sense I am doing um, a lot of sewing and because it is kind of my job now uh, that's why I do tend to do a, a lot. But I remember back to when I was working full-time as a teacher and then when I was taking care of my son full-time, those periods of time in my life when I didn't have as much time for making things as I would have liked. I can, remember, I can remember seeing people on the internet sharing the things that they've made and just being absolutely blown away with how they can create so much. And I still feel like that today when I see people making quilt after quilt after quilt. There's just no way that I could do that. Um, I just don't have that amount of time 
to spend. I don't know how people do it, I think it's incredible. <laughs> but it can feel, when, you, when you're faced with that, you can feel like, you're, you can feel disheartened about it. And I really hope that I, that there isn't anything that I'm putting out that's making anybody feel like that, that you don't have enough time. I don't feel like I'm producing a lot of things. My projects tend to be small. But again, we all have different amounts of time that we can spend on things, don't we? But I have some tips from when I really felt like I didn't have much time when I was working and things like that. But I really try to put my phone out of the way and focus on what I know I want to do and what is going to be beneficial to me. So whether that is sewing or going out and being in my garden, I don't watch a lot of television. I hardly watch anything at all. Um, I will put on certain things while I'm sewing or listen to an audiobook. That's usually what I'm doing. But I actually just don't find there's very much on TV that suits me. Um, I have quite specific tastes in programmes. Um, so I don't spend a lot of my time doing that. And I think that... I think if I was watching TV all the time that would take away from crafting and sewing and things like that. And I also try to have things prepared and ready so I can pick them up and put them down. Um, so I have projects where my shapes are basted so I, I can just spend a few minutes stitching them and then I can put it down. So I think that's a good way to fit things in. Well I hope that that helped and I hope that has answered your question, Ronelle. So the next genre of questions is all about design and inspiration. So I received a lot of questions about this. So on YouTube, Rachel asked, please can you talk more about your design process, how you go from natural inspirations to a finished idea? Mary on YouTube asked, you have made some beautiful items, where do you get your inspiration from? And she mentioned that she's um, lost her sojo recently. And then I also had some questions. I had, I think this one was on Patreon. Have you ever embroidered small animals, fairies, mice, foxes, and bunnies? I see you're a fan of Beatrix Potter and Jill Barklam of Brambley Hedge. Do you also like Tasha Tudor and Cicely Mary Barker books and illustrations? And if yes, can you recommend a template for designs or simply tracing onto fabric. Um, jo on Patreon asked me, where do you get inspiration for new projects from and do you have favourite designers that you follow? So lots of questions there about design and inspiration. So I think the number one place where I get my inspiration from is the natural world. It's no secret that I absolutely love nature. It really, really makes me feel better when I'm outdoors, looking at flowers and butterflies and things like that. It just has a huge impact on me. And that's where it all begins, really. I don't feel creative. I, sorry if you heard somebody scream in the background then. That was my cat. <laughs> um, my cat's very old and is quite senile and so screams out all the time. No harm is coming to her, so I'm really sorry if you heard that. Um, she's very loud at the moment. <clears throat> so, where was I? Um, so, I don't feel cr like creating, I don't feel good and I don't feel creative if I haven't had enough nature. <laughs> So nature really is the absolute most important ingredient for me. And that's where creativity starts. I use a lot of motifs from nature in the things that I create. So flowers in my embroidery, floral fabrics, floral motifs in my English paper piecing, that sort of thing. So being outdoors in nature, seeing those things fills me up, fills me up and makes me feel good and makes me feel creative. And then to talk about the, the design process, 
I really think it's just a combination of seeing those things and feeling feeling alive by looking at nature and then it just seems to translate naturally into my work so if we look at my flower embroideries for example which this piece isn't finished it's been unfinished for a long time but it will it will get finished um i just it's difficult to explain how I go from the natural inspiration to the finished idea. It just sort of evolves, really, and I'm sorry I can't give a more concrete answer than that. But I tend to sketch things out a little bit and just play around with ideas and shapes and repetition. I like repetition. It's that idea of a pattern, like patterned fabric, that kind of thing. Um, I also had another question about, um, it was from Suzanne, what books are inspiring to me? So that's another thing where I draw inspiration from, is from books. And some the, the person who asked me about Jill Barkley and um, Cecily Mary Barker, yes, I do. I love all of those illustrators, authors, and I'm I have collections of books by them so I love flower fairies flower fairies were my favorite thing when I was little and I had all of the flower fairies toys if you were a child of the 80s and then you'll know possibly what I'm referring to but I had the flower fairies dolls and the detail in those toys and I've still got them and I've played with them with my son the detail in them that magical fairy world in nature, it, the the tree stump house and all of that, it just, yeah, it's just been a part of me. So I, I guess I take all of that inspiration and put it into the things that I create. I also really love William Morris designs. He uses so much nature inspired elements in his designs, doesn't he? They're full of plants and patterns and repetition. So for example, the strawberry, farm piece that I recently did I think that has a nod back to the patterned wallpaper elements of William Morris design so I have books about William Morris I have books about flower fairies and flowers I'm currently reading rereading the secret garden that was one of my absolute favorite stories as a child and I'm reading that and I've recently bought myself a book to accompany that which is all about the actual plants and flowers that inspired the story so yeah I tend to read things like that and it just as I said before fills me up and makes me feel good and makes me feel creative and then I just take that into my work and into my designs so I hope that has answered those questions about design inspiration so we have some questions now about English paper piecing so Simple Country Charm on YouTube asked me, where do you find EPP templates? Hexagons are easy to find, but other shapes are not so much. Well, I tend to buy my templates pre-cut to the correct shape and size that I need. And I buy them from, if I'm using paper, I buy them from Sew and Quilt, and I'll link that below. And I'm in the UK, so that's the shop that I really recommend. And I also use Hexiform, and they come already pre-cut in the shapes and sizes all the shapes and sizes that you could ever want so I buy them like that but if I'm making them myself or I just need a couple to try out an idea then I don't really find there's nowhere I can think of online where you can just get a free download of shapes I, I don't know of anywhere I have hexagons on my website but I tend to make them myself so as part of developing this um, design, my designs and my small business, I've taught myself to use Adobe Illustrator and I use that to create shapes and I'll print them off and, and use those. So I would recommend definitely buying them pre-cut though. I think that's going to save you a lot of time as well. So I think it's Elaine asked on YouTube about how are my hexagon flowers so puffy? And that is because of the hexiform. Now when you buy hexiform, and I have some here, so let me just show you. When you buy 
hexiform. It is flat. <laughs> Let's see if that's going to... Yeah, it is flat. Um, but when you create your shape and if you applique it onto a backing fabric as I did in my he um, hex petal flower quilt, when you then quilt around it, it puffs up and it looks like it's been stuffed with something. It's a really interesting um, texture that it gives to it. It's not the same as if you were to make the whole quilt from hexiform and then quilt it. It's because those shapes are appliqued on and then quilted around it, it gives it that raised texture. So that's all it is, there's nothing nothing special about it, just that. Somebody else asked me what batting I use, as well. and I, I use this one, Hobbs Heirloom Premium Cotton Batting. It's 80% cotton and 20% polyester, and that is, that is my batting of choice. It's quite thin, but I really, I really like that, use that for everything. Um, Flossie on YouTube asked me what is the sequence to piece a flower together so she wasn't sure whether you join all the petals to the central bit first how do you do it you can do it in any way you like but I have some videos that show how I do it I have a sequence to it which means that I never break the thread so I don't join them all to the center and then go up the sides because I'm a bit lazy and I like to stitch in a continuous way so it means I'm not stopping and starting. So I will link down below some videos in which I have shown how to piece the flower together and hopefully that will be helpful. So thank you for that question. So I had some lots of questions about fabric as well. So Lizzie on Patreon asked me how do you pick the colours and fabrics for your projects? And then I had quite a few people on Instagram ask me, um, where do you buy your fabrics from? In fact, that was the most common question on Instagram, where do you buy fabrics from? So fabric is a really interesting topic, isn't it? I am really drawn to floral fabrics and pastel colours. So when I buy fabric, I tend to buy fabrics that fall into those categories. Florals, usually medium to small to even tiny florals, they're the ones I'm drawn to. Although I do love big florals as well, but they don't work as well for patchwork. So that tends to be pretty much what's in my fabric stash. And pastel colours. Where do I buy my fabric from? Well, I buy it from Sew and Quilt because they sell lovely quilting cottons, but they also sell Liberty fabric. I buy it from Alice Car Caroline. They sell pretty much all the Liberty that you can ever imagine. <laughs> um, I have received fabric from Ava and Neve in Australia. So if you're in Australia, they sell Liberty fabric. And there are some shops in the US that sell it as well. So. There is Morris Textiles, she sells Liberty Fabric, she's based in the US, she's online. Um, there's Duckadilly Fabrics, they sell Liberty and they're in the US. And I have in my head that I want to make a video about Liberty Fabric and about where to buy it and a real focus on it because it is the top question that I'm always asked. So that will happen later this year. Um, planning that as we speak. When it comes to putting fabrics together for a project then what I tend to do is just think about colours and I try to get a bit of a balance. Um, I try to make sure there's contrast and I use a lot of solid fabric if you might have noticed. I, I tend to put solids in with the Liberty fabrics to break it up and so it doesn't feel really overwhelming and I kind of stick to the same colour palette for those soft teal, soft pinks, um, sort of off-whites and they I usually use Tilda fabrics for those and I really love their florals as well. I don't really have that much of that but um, yeah I like those and I use some art gallery 
fabrics as well for their solids because the feel of the art gallery fabric is similar to Liberty Tanner Lawn. I think this is a really big topic and I will definitely do a video all about Liberty fabric and where you can get it and then I'll probably do another video really focusing on how I put fabrics together for a project because I think that's something we can go quite more in depth on. So I hope that's a good enough answer for now. I'm sorry it, it, it isn't a really in-depth one, but hopefully there'll be some videos on that to come in the future. So Pam over on Patreon says, I was wondering if you have a local quilt store or if you have to shop online for fabrics. I know you use a lot of Liberty fabrics, but didn't know if you were able to purchase them locally or not. Well, thank you for that question, Pam. Um, I don't have a local fabric shop that is really suitable for quilting. So in the next town, we do have a small fabric shop, which is good for dressmaking, particularly if you're making costumes, maybe for dance shows and things like that. But there isn't really a large selection of, well, there isn't really any, any, any fabrics that would suit anybody for quilting. Um, we have a department store in Liverpool which is about 40 minutes away from me and it's John Lewis it's called and they sometimes have some quilting fabrics but again they mostly have dressmaking fabrics and I haven't shopped in there for years. Um, in all of these places though you can't buy Liberty fabric. There is another shop called Abacan and that's in Liverpool as well and they sometimes have some Liberty fabric. I've never bought any in there and that shop is really good. I have bought other things there in the past. They have lots of really cheap fabrics that you can buy by weight. Um, so really great, mostly for dressmaking and um, homewares, upholstery and that sort of thing. But there isn't a local quilt shop to me. There used to be a lovely quilt shop in Chester. So that's about an hour plus away from me. But I would definitely make the trip to go there because it was a lovely shop. Um, but that, that's gone now, that went just before the pandemic. So they had a lot of fabrics from America there. It was, it was a great shop. I, I miss that shop. <laughs> I used to really enjoy going and collecting all the little fat quarters up because they had them all on the shelves next to the bolts. It was great, but that no longer exists. Um, I think the nearest fabric quilting type shop to me is in Blackpool. So again, that's a, at least an hour from me. Um, and it's called So Hot, and they have a great online shop. So if you're in the UK, you might have heard of them. You can get all the Laurie Holt fabrics from there. So if I'm buying things like that, I'll buy them from there. Um, and I hope to visit that shop in person one day. But in terms of Liberty fabric, I buy it from the places that I mentioned before. So Sew and Quilt, Alice Caroline, yeah, it's a real shame that we don't have a local quilt shop here. Um, yeah, I miss I miss that really. But I, I buy everything online and thank goodness for online shopping. But I do really miss the opportunity to go into a shop and to look at things. I think you can get a sense of what goes together much better in person than you can online. So what I tend to do is put fabrics all into my basket online and then try and look at the list and look at the pictures and see what they look like together before I make that um, commitment to buying them. But it is really hard. It's much easier if you're buying everything from one fabric collection because you know that they're all going to work together. But because I like that scrappy look, I like things to be from different collections and just to be all different but to kind of work together so it it can happen that you know you buy online and then when it arrives it's not quite exactly what you thought it was going to be like the only time that i would buy or would be able to buy fabric in person really is at a show like the knitting and stitching show or the festival of quilts and i think a lot of people in this country tend to save up for those shows because they are just a brilliant opportunity to be able to buy fabric in person. So I'm saving up for that this year. Um, I didn't buy anything last year at the Festival of Quilts so I really hope that this year I can save up a bit more and 
be able to buy some things of course with a project in mind <laughs> so I think that's all of the questions um, I hope I've answered them all if I have missed something out then I am really sorry um, I didn't make it easy for myself by having the questions in all the different places so there's a possibility I've missed something but thank you so much for watching and thank you to everybody who sent a question in I hope you've enjoyed this Q&A and just a big heartfelt thank you to you all for 25,000 subscribers it's incredible I never thought that I would be able to achieve that um, I think it's amazing and I'm really enjoying what I'm doing here and I really appreciate you so thank you once again and I'll see you in the next video so until then take care bye bye